Uh, I think this is presentation number 56 or 57. Even the people at the back have lost count. I will be very, very brief. And if you don't mind, I'm, I'm going to sound a slightly discordant note. Um, I, I was really quite disappointed uh, with today's protesters. I, I thought their timing was quite good. I, I rather like their slogan, the IMF is the problem, not the solution. I've studied carefully their liter literature. I had a number of interactions with them. And no, I was not arrested by King's College porters. Steve, you may not put that in your blog. Uh, I was trying to get the porter to, to uh, read my book, which, is, which, which should be of interest to protesters everywhere. And I was just, it only came out last. Don't laugh, Joe. They hadn't read your books either. Uh, <laughs> My book, Joe's book is terrific, Free Fall, and, and I do recommend that to, to dissonant students everywhere. Their literature, by the way, was very 1980s. I think you, all the Cambridge faculty, you have to address that. My book is called 13 Bankers, The Wall Street Takeover and the Next Financial Meltdown, and it, it is perfect any time you want to take on the managing director um, of the IMF. And I even have a website to help you do that. It's called BaselineScenario.com with a lot of helpful tips for confronting um, figures in authority and bankers uh, around the world. Now, the, the question, the key issue, yes, he gets it at the back. The, the key issue, the key issue I, I would put to you uh, is, this, is exactly the issue that Secretary Geithner um, is um, bringing up and, and putting forward to Congress, which is, what did we just go through? What have we been talking about the past two days? What, have, what, what happened to us all uh, in and after September 2008? Was it a 40-year flood, a, a very rare occurrence, a one-off in our professional uh, careers, and something Secretary Geithner says you shouldn't overreact to because you will regret it. Between years 1 and 39, you will suffer slower growth as a consequence of excessive reform, excessive control, excessive regulation. Um, and it's only in the 40th year that you may think you, you may realize that what you did was okay. That's the official view. That's the Washington view. That's the view of our friends in the administration and, and of congressional leadership. But I would suggest to you it's something rather different, that actually... What we encountered most recently was certainly the most severe financial crisis since World War II, and, and certainly something we don't want to repeat again, but very much the outcome of a change in our financial structure and, and a change, uh, Thomas, I would suggest in our politics, um, based, based on your presentation also, over the past 30 years. Now, one, one way to think about this, a, a fairly inadequate way, but, but just, just a way to illustrate, is look at what, what has happened to the uh, federal funds rate, which is the, the uh, line that comes down, starts up uh, high and comes down uh, to zero, obviously, or near zero now. Now, this is a measure of short-term interest rates. It uh, obviously reflects uh, changing um, inflation expectations, among other things. But it also shows you um, a, a manifestation uh, of, of, of the issues that we've just been discussing, the, the, uh, that Ed was just discussing, actually, interest rate cuts in, in the face of every crisis. And we've reached zero. We've tried our hand at quantitative easing. We don't know to what extent monetary policy or fiscal policy will be sufficient to deal with the next set of shocks. At the same time as we see at least this measure of private sector uh, credit to GDP, measured on the right-hand axis, rising over time, this clearly underestimates the extent to which the financial sector has grown over this time period. And maybe we're not um, talking about uh, a random shock. We're talking much more about a cycle um, or, or, or a loop. Um, and, and this is obviously language that's been taken up by uh, the Bank of England to some extent by Andrew Haldane um, and, uh, and Adair Turner. I don't know if he's still here. His picture features here, only in a positive way. Uh, Lord Turner, if you are still here. Um, but it's, it's a cycle in which um, we, the bailouts... Actually, uh, Joe Stiglitz has a great line. He said, if this crisis hadn't occurred, Joe would have uh, seen that as a failure of economics because the incentive problems are so bad that this should lead to moral hazard, excessive risk-taking, capture of regulators, and then repeated cycles of bailout. I think that's exactly right. And I would say, while we certainly need to look for new economic thinking, we also need to draw on some very well-established uh, economic thinking that's already been rewarded with a Nobel Prize, because these problems of incentives are very clear and very powerful and very much what, what, what is driving this. We are going around and around, and we absolutely have not fixed the underlying incentive problems. Now, there was a wonderful picture just now in, in Rob's presentation which showed the relative wages of regulators and the people they're trying to regulate. I'm going to ask permission to use that data in the next version of this figure. This just shows you what happened to uh, private sector, uh, what happened to financial sector wages relative to the rest of the private sector, going back to uh, as early as you, as you can, which is uh, 1907. And this is drawing on some terrific work by Thomas Philippon and Ariel Reshev. And they look at this relative wage and compare it with 
um, the, the regulation or deregulation, if you like, of finance. And of course, what's really interesting is if you go back before the 1930s, so that's uh, to the left of the graph as you look at it, finance was relatively unregulated and it was relatively highly paid. It was a smaller part of the U.S. economy, probably only 1% or 2%. Uh, of GDP as opposed to the 6, 7, 8% of GDP we've seen more recently. But still, it was a, it was a high paid sector. And of course, what happened from, coming from the reforms of the 1930s is that the wages were compressed. This was, it was a good job. 363 banking is what it's sometimes known as. Um, pay 3% on deposits, lend it out at 6% and be on the golf course by 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So this was not a hard life. But it wasn't the dynamic, exciting, um, draw for talented people within, within society, and it wasn't the, the reckless risk-taking. What has happened since uh, the late 1970s, particularly since the Reagan Revolution in, 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 in the United States, is that deregulation applied to, applied to finance allowed people in the financial sector to make much more money and allowed them to plow that money back uh, into further uh, deregulation. And if you look at the, the profits that have been made uh, by this sector um, since... Um, uh, the 19, since the 1980s, and, and uh, even more so since, since 1990, because, of course, this is a bipartisan movement. And it is, uh, as, we, as we... Did I mention that I have a book, 13 Bankers? Okay. In our book, um, we, we, we take you through this in, it, it, blow by blow, and we think it's the capture, actually, of the Democratic Party by Wall Street that was the decisive event, because the Democrats were somewhat resistant to Wall Street and to the Reagan attempts to deregulate finance in the 1980s, as, as, Rob, as Rob can tell you. And, and Thomas did tell you, but in the 1990s that changed. And this allowed, and this, this Joe, I think, is, is the most fascinating puzzle um, for, uh, for theory and for financial theory and, and, and for thinking about market structure, because the excess profits earned by the financial sector since 1990 have just been extraordinary. This shows you profits with an index, uh, in real terms, with an index of uh, equal to 100 in, in 1980. So it shows you how much better finance did the non-financial sector. There's another version of this, of this picture where you, look at, you can look at the share um, of the financial sector in total corporate profits. It's extraordinary. In the early uh, 2000s, this peaked at 40%. 40% of corporate profits in, made in the financial sector, which is supposed to be an intermediate good, it's supposed to be competitive. It's, they are certainly not held accountable according to our existing rather traditional antitrust laws and guidelines and thinking, which, which I'm sure need to be updated, and I'm sure that should be front and center of the agenda for new economic thinking. So finance became deregulated. Finance became extremely profitable. Finance plowed the money back into political connections, into the campaign contributions we just heard about, and into an ideology. The ideology of finance has captured Washington. And this problem is not going away. This is, I think, a, a, a good illustration, just one illustration at this point. The biggest banks in the United States, if you look, for example, here at um, their assets relative to GDP, the biggest banks, the biggest six banks, uh, now have assets around 63% of, of GDP in the United States, which I understand is not big relative to some European countries, and, and, and my condolences to those European countries. And you have a much bigger problem. But in the United States, what's striking is the six banks got bigger as a result of the boom, as a result of the bailout, as a result of what's happened in the last few years, they were uh, 57, 55% total assets relative to GDP before the crisis. If you go back to the mid-1990s, the uh, same six banks had 17% assets relative to GDP. No one can show you, by the way, we, and again, we go through this in, in detail in the book, no one can show you any economies of scale or scope or other benefits for society for banks being bigger than $100 billion. And we've, we've created trillion-dollar banks. Citigroup, uh, the, moment, the moment it failed, I'm sorry, ran into liquidity difficulties. I always get those two things confused. In, in fall 2008, Citigroup was a $2.5 trillion bank. Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, said to his shareholders in a letter just this last week, big represents efficiency, and if we want to get bigger, we should, it's just the outcome of an ordinary market process. It is not. This is a massive subsidy. This is government, implicit government subsidies. This is an incredibly inefficient and dangerous form of subsidy, actually. This is unfair. This is not any kind of market economy that, that, that we should want to live in. The biggest banks have become bigger. They've become stronger. They're more powerful politically. I, I live in Washington. I, I argue these things out day to day with officials, with other people in the political process on Capitol Hill. 
These banks are more dangerous now than they were before the crisis. These banks, you can argue, some of them perhaps felt they were too big to fail before September 2008. We can have that discussion. I can assure you, they, they, they know they're too big to fail. Now, the biggest financial institution that was allowed to fail in the United States in 2009 was CIT Group, which had a balance sheet of $80 billion, eight zero. They screamed up and down that if they're allowed to fail, this would be a terrible disruption to small and medium-sized lending, which was what they specialized in, and that they had to be rescued. The Obama administration decided not to rescue them, and that was a good decision. There was no clear disruption of lending anywhere in, in the US or global economy as a result. That was 80 billion. Goldman Sachs' balance sheet fluctuates around $800 billion. If Goldman Sachs hit a rock today, well, what's the chance that they will be allowed to fail and go through bankruptcy? It's zero. They're clearly too big to fail. In fact, I, I would suggest if you go back to that, think about that first picture and think about the monetary, the policy responses, the issue before us now is, is actually moving beyond too big to fail. We have too big to fail. We are not going to fix it with the Dodd bill. We'll have the argument. We'll have the debate. I'm fighting very hard with people who want to amend the Dodd bill to make it more effective. But honestly, I think, I think we're, I think we'll lose. I'm sorry, I think we'll win for Steve's blog. But honestly, I th off, the, off the record, I think we'll lose. It'll be, a good, it'll be a good fight. It's a fight worth having. It's a very important debate. And I do think that over the next 10 years, we'll move the consensus. It, in 1902, when Theodore Roosevelt decided to take on the Industrial Trust of the United States, the massive railroad trust run by J.P. Morgan, Nobody knew what Roosevelt was doing. There was no theory, no well-developed theory of antitrust at that moment. The Senate was known as the Millionaire's Club for a reason. J.P. Morgan came to see Roosevelt in the White House. And he said, if we've done anything wrong, send your man to see my man and we'll fix it up. And Theodore Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, and his attorney general said no. We don't want to fix it up. We want to stop it. That was 1902. By 1912, the, the consensus among people like you 100 years ago had shifted completely. And Standard Oil, there had been an antitrust movement. It was the consensus moved. And, and that's why we wrote the book, to try and move that consensus, to try and push that debate. And I hope and believe that's what this institute will do going forward. By 1912, they were ready and able and willing to break up Standard Oil, one, the most powerful company, I, I would argue, in, in the United States at, at that time. The lifeblood of the economy was oil. It was broken up, and it was broken up in, in terrific American fashion. All the shareholders did well. The Rockefellers even rehabilitated themselves with charitable acts. And we created the foundation for fair competition and, and removing this oppressive corporate and personal power from American society. We need to do it again, plain and simple. We need to do it again. We need to relaunch that antitrust thinking. We need another Theodore Roosevelt moment. We need to apply it today to the big banks, just like Theodore Roosevelt applied it 100 years ago to the excessively big industrial trusts. Thank you very much. <laughs>